Hello, yeah. I am Hilary Hahn, and I'm here with, who are you? Jillian Whitehead. Yes. <laughs> so Jillian, I think this is the farthest I've ever done an interview um, on Skype. So I'm in New York, and you are in... I'm in Dunedin, uh, which is in the south of New Zealand, um, Fairly close to the to the um, bottom of New Zealand, uh, it's a long way away. Very far away. And uh, we're in the middle of summer. Here. <laughs> yes. So right now it's winter and it's about eight thirty p.m. So what is it for you in New Zealand? Uh, it's um, it's about two thirty in the afternoon, um, but it's your tomorrow. And is it warm so or is it cold? Um, uh, it's been cold, but it's uh, warming. The sun's come out at last. Summer, right? How is it where you are? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, things are good here. Um, it's a little chilly, but it's actually been a very nice day. It's been sunny, so I guess, you know, I sent the sun over to you now. <laughs> but I wanted to talk to you because, well, for one thing, you're a composer. For another thing, you um, you are very active as a as a composer these days and you wrote a piece for my project of encores so I wanted to ask you how did you get started with composing and um, what do you like about it? I was um, lucky and my parents were both musicians and my father conducted choirs and he imported music from overseas and he was importing to New Zealand and music by Webern, Schoenberg, uh, Stockhausen, that was not music that you could get anywhere else here. Um, so although I at that stage wasn't that interested in it, I was aware of it and it was around me. And I just grew up in a house where people were learning uh, instruments and, uh, and I learned to play piano and violin myself and gradually through a... I, I studied music at university and it was during that stage um, when I was working particularly with a composer called Ron Tremaine, who was at Buffalo, uh, I mean, who went on to Buffalo, um, that I, I started really to want to compose. And it just sort of became more and more important and just gradually took over. And, I mean, it's the thing I do best. I, I'm, I'm not a performer. I, I don't enjoy performance. Um, but composing has become my life. Have you performed much yourself? Since you don't enjoy it, I wonder what your experience has been with it. Oh, really, just, I suppose, when I was um, a student, um, I just got terrible nerves, really. Oh. And I always much preferred... Or if I was playing a piece or, or, or practicing a piece, I was more interested in the way the piece was put together than, than in making making the piece um, sound. Um, so I would um, see it more like that. I, I'm just not a performer. What was your first official piece? Oh, goodness. Um, I can't remember. I remember. <laughs> That's telling. Uh, <laughs> it's always been with you. <laughs> well, when you when you first, um, I'm kind of curious if you if you have always thought about music from a composer's perspective. When you first heard it from an audience perspective, what was your impression of your own music? Was it what you thought it would sound like? Um. I, yes, um, although I think, you know, when you first hear pieces, uh, sometimes they give, you know, the, the first pieces you write give you a bit of a surprise because, um, you know, maybe it sounds better than you thought it was going to or um, sometimes quite frequently when, you know, when you're starting, it sounds a lot worse than you think it's going to, you know, because you've written something and, you know, which you think... Um, would sound good, and it would if if um, if the instrument 
um, I don't know, maybe sounded better in that register. You know, you, you start by making all kinds of mistakes <laughs> and then gradually as time goes on, <laughs> mm-hmm. fewer and fewer, I hope. Mm-hmm. Do you, since you live in New Zealand, um, well, I guess I, I have one question that comes from two different angles. Do you have particular influences in your work that come from New Zealand? I, I noticed that you seem to, but I was wondering about your perspective on that. And also, um, what instrument do you come to music from? What is your entry point to writing? Um, well, uh, my entry point to writing, uh, I suppose it's just imagining the sounds of whatever instrument I'm particularly writing for. Um, the New Zealand influence, uh, I spent oh, the first 15 years of my, um, you know, when I was moved on from being a student to, to being a composer, I suppose, um, I was living in Europe, so I was surrounded by European, um, uh, or I, I was surrounded by the European tradition and particularly the Second Viennese School. Um, and but at the same time, every time I came back to New Zealand, there was something. Um, you know, I was missing a lot of things: the the Maori thing, the the landscape, the 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 sounds you grow up with. And when I came back here, um, I started working with Richard Nuns, who plays the. Tongapuru, which are the Māori instruments, and I suddenly realised that it, or I didn't realise it at first, but I suddenly saw that I might be able to combine it with Western instruments. Uh, he works totally in an improvising way. Oh. So I worked with him and, um, and gradually working in this way, um, I found that the work I was doing with him also influenced most of the rest of what I was doing. Which, so it sort of changed me, you know, I mean, just gradually the way I work changed over the years. It's quite different now from what it was 20 years ago. It was much more angular and... Um, uh, Less tonal. I, I don't know. It was, it was just, just very different. How do you pronounce the name um, of that instrument one more time? The Tongapuru. Uh, T A O N. Go on. No, no, go ahead. T A O N. T T A O N G A P U O R O. It means um, Tonga is means treasure, and Puru uh, means sound. So it's. Um, Treasures of sound. Mm-hmm. You say you work, and they're all in. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> it's the satellite yeah. connection. Uh, I, I'm a little delayed. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're instruments that are um, very different from Western news instruments. Very different from the um, First Nation uh, instruments in America and Canada. Um, they they're made of wood, of bone, of of um, jade, this is an instrument here, it's, oh. it's a bird call, it's called a kangamanu, it calls birds, uh, it probably won't work. Um, oh, wow. And and, I, and made I heard of stone. That. I um, that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, they all have a very small range, not more than a minor third um, in range, sometimes less than that. And or oh, oh, they're made. Of, some of them are made of shell. So I found working with that. It, 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 it's an amazing amazing sound world because it's so different from anything we knew and it was everything they knew and it was their 
spirituality and their uh, their entertainment, the way they carried their traditions, um, was all supported by the the Tangapuru. So uh, that that has has influenced me and and what I've learned through working with them and the language. When you say working with, uh, that was a really new. Sorry. Sorry. When you say working was, with and it's improvised, um, do you mean you're playing with with them on their instruments, or you're listening to them and taking note of what they're doing? Uh, I know what the instruments do, and I write something um, so that the sound of the instruments can be embedded in what the um, Western instruments do. Um, I know very much what he will play and how he will play, and I realize that he works much better if things aren't notated. Um, so, but everything else is. Everything else is, and and yeah, I'm very I'm very suspic uh, specific, um, you know, about how those instruments will be played. Do you improvise with them yourself? Uh, um, no, but I've encouraged the um, the Western um, instrumentalists um, perhaps to improvise a bit along with him, which which means that a, a performance. Um, I mean, obviously, there are the, the fixed points are always there, but then every now and again the detail changes and you can get something quite magic sometimes. Well, what are you working on right now? Um, I'm just about to start a string quartet for the Enzo Quartet, uh, which is um, um, coming up from from the States and they're uh, doing a Chamber Music New Zealand tour later this year so mm -hmm. um, I'm about to um, write a piece for them um, which I'm looking forward to. Are you in between pieces right now then? Yes, that's right, yes, which what is a nice that? feeling. Yeah, what does that feel like? <laughs> oh, well, it's a good time to tidy the house. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so when you're looking at composing a string quartet, how do you prepare for that? Are you gathering ideas into a notebook? Are you um, speaking with the musicians? Are you um, sort of structuring the piece before you write it? I roughly structure the piece before I write it. I, um, I listen to the quartet themselves to get a feel for how they play. Um, and uh, if if the instrumentalists around, you know, then I I really like to work with them. But if it's a string quartet living in the states, it's a bit difficult from here. So um, I uh, I'm, I'm I'm thinking a lot, you know, um, and. We you know uh, the idea eventually comes, um, or the ideas come and change. And when I start a piece, I always start at the beginning. Some people, some people don't. They seem to be able to to work at the beginning, in the middle, and the end. Um, I need to start at the beginning of a piece and work at the beginning of the piece over and over until the trajectory of it's right and the scale the scale of it's right and the scope of it's right. Um, and then um, I will go back periodically, but but you know the, the piece sort of gradually rolls on, and eventually there'll come a time when I'm not going to make any changes at the beginning of the piece. So um, I mean that that's more or less more or less how it works. It seems logical to start at the beginning <laughs> and get the beginning. Well, some right. people don't. <laughs> and sometimes you think you've begun at the beginning and then you find actually that wasn't quite the beginning at all. You need to go back and sort of come into that and then maybe even further back. But uh, mostly I managed to start at the beginning and go on to the end and stop. Well, you wrote a wonderfully evocative piece for me 
And um, I was wondering if you would like to talk about that encore a little bit. Okay, well the piece is called Toro, um, and it's a Māori word which has several meanings um, that I thought were appropriate for the piece. Um, the rua uh, is a word and one of its meanings is two. So I was thinking two players. Um, it, it's a word that means um, it also has to do with the change of the tide. Um, so, you know, when, when the current of the tide changes or the current of the wind changes, um, that is torua. It's also a weaving pattern, um, you know, where you have um, two layers of flax going over one, so you get a diagonal pattern out of it. Um, so that that seemed to be a name for the piece, but when I uh, was about, or just a few days before I wrote the piece, um, there was a very bad earthquake in Christchurch. There'd been one um, in September the previous year, um, a very... Uh, 7.8 I think, um, a, a very severe earthquake and what was remarkable about that first earthquake when there was a lot of damage, nobody was killed and people were gradually getting over this and then came this other earthquake, it, it was a shallower earthquake um, and it did huge damage and 185 people died and it really changed the feel of the city forever. Now this happened um, in February and I had a, a deadline for the piece possibly the middle of March and I had been in Wellington and I came home and I had to sit down and start thinking about, well, I mean, I've been thinking about the piece, but had to start writing it. And it, um, and it was hard to sit down and write in those circumstances. But I think uh, the piece certainly came out of that. It's quite a somber piece, I think. Um, and um, there was an image... The, after that earthquake of the of dust rising and I think the first bars of the piece I, I just wanted a figure that was just going to rise like that and I've got a lot of friends who live there and they all they all came through fine but their lives are all changed forever really you know, to live through something like that and, and, I mean, the thing that since that first earthquake in September, they've had something like 7,600 earthquakes. So it's a constant, constant thing there. And, um, yes, so, so I feel that coloured the piece a lot. Well, in, um, in what way was the influence literal and in what sense was it just that the piece came out of your mindset at that time? Mostly the piece came out of my mind then. Um, the only image I would say was the one right at the beginning, mm -hmm. um, you know, of of something rising. And, and that, to me, certainly had something to do with, with seeing that dust rising after the earthquake. Well, some people um, would say that there is... A cathartic process to being able to create something out of a certain mood or a certain frame of mind. Of course, it's an unfortunate um, frame of mind to be forced to be in. Yes. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that sort of thing as it relates to creativity. So I think coming out of Christchurch since then, there's been um, a lot of... Um, a lot of good, you know, fine artistic achievement, a very good film, 
I saw the other day called When a City Falls. Um, I guess someone was working with a gamelan and wrote perhaps the most moving piece for gamelan I've ever heard because gamelan doesn't usually move you. It, it's exhilarating, it's exciting. But, um, for you, though, was it a, a helpful process to write or was it... Um, was it a struggle? It, it was a bit of a struggle, but it was helpful too. I mean, you know, it was just, you know, knowing I had a deadline and that I just had to get down and do it. It was probably a very good thing, actually. Um, and and um, I was working on it and I sort of felt once there's something not quite right about it, something not quite... Right, and then I realised there was a bird that had been singing outside um, all the time I'd been writing, and uh, I suddenly thought, "Oh, yes, that's that's what the piece is missing," and that um, sort of comes in the second phase of the piece, really, in the unaccompanied piece, um, and and also the bit right at the end, it, it, it um, comes back then. In fact, I was I was quite almost wanting to make this a solo solo one violin piece. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of, anyway. Oh, and so my final question for you is, what does your studio look like? What is your working environment? Is it, like you mentioned there's a bird outside your window. Do you have chaos or do you, you look like you're very tidy from your background. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Um, um, uh, well, I mean, that's just the way the camera is pointing. <laughs> um, oh, it's, it's um, vaguely chaotic. Um, you know, there's a computer on my desk and, and uh, with keyboard and the piano's in the other part of the house. But uh, what I really like about this room, oh, it's got some lovely paintings on the wall, is that I look out one way and there's a hill and um, trees and I look out the other way and there's and hill and trees, and uh, it, it's just lovely to to work in an environment where you 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 know you're surrounded by trees, mostly mostly New Zealand trees, um, and sky and hills and water. It's a it's a wonderful place to work. It sounds great. Well, thank you so much, Gillian. I really appreciate this. Uh, it's a pleasure, Hilary, and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing the piece sometime. You'll hear it very, very, very soon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.